Hi, I'm Allie Hamilton, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the Come As You Are podcast. Every week, we'll be talking about some aspect of healing, usually around childhood wounds and complicated familial relationships. The topics will always coincide with my personal essay of the week, and this will be a place where we can take a deep dive together. I'm so thrilled you've joined me and delighted for you to always come as you are. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome to our talk this week. The topic is It Doesn't Matter. That is the title of the essay that I wrote this week and what I want to dive into today. And this is another ap- episode uh, where, you know, if you have small children, this is not a good episode for them to sort of be in the background. So I wanted to mention that right at the top. I, there are so many things that inspired the essay this week. I really wanted to kind of write something lighthearted and funny. And then, you know, just like too many things happened that were enraging really. And one of them is I'm sure many of us have been watching the Olympics in Paris, and um, I came to understand that there was a man, uh, Stephen Vandeveld, who is playing, was playing, he's been eliminated now, but um, the men's beach volleyball, and representing his country, and it turned out that he had been convicted of raping a 12-year-old child um, 10 years 10 years ago so he is now 29 he was 19 at the time she was 12 and I just really could not fathom that this person who did something so unspeakable so a girl a child that he met on Facebook and then flew to England where she lived and, you know, got her drunk, um, would now be the person who gets to go on and call himself an Olympian, participate in the Olympics, whether he meddled or he didn't, which he didn't. But, you know, that that doesn't disqualify you. Um, And I just... So I, I started reading about the case and what had happened, and um, it, it, this is part of what is problematic when you are in a patriarchy, and that is where we're at, right? And so you're swimming in these waters, and these messages are in the water, and everyone is soaking them up. And this is an absolutely perfect example Um, And people might say, well, he was 19, and what about, you know, redemption and rehabilitation and all of that? Well, he served 13 months, and when he was sentenced, the judge talked about how sad this was and his shattered Olympic dreams. Um, And then he, he went and he served 13 months, and he went right back to training, and as we can all see, his Olympic dreams were not shattered. And not only can we all see it, his victim can see it, his survivor, you know. She's now a 22-year-old young woman and undoubtedly understands that he's participating in the Olympics. So what is the message, right? The message is this guy's dreams and future were valued so much more than her experience. Like, is there not a line where you know, maybe he serves his time and it could be a little longer than 13 months, you know, actually does some serious, like, deep work because something has gone very, very wrong in so many ways if you think that's okay. Um, And you you don't get to then go represent your country at the Olympics. Like, there's a line somewhere where his life does get to go on and he does get to, you know, try to rehabilitate himself and and carry forward but maybe not not somebody who's going to then be celebrated and rooted for at the olympics now that's not to say there were a lot of people booing for him and this story became very um 
prominent. So it's not like people didn't understand what had happened, but it just shouldn't have happened in the first place. And these messages, like that's a big one, but they're coming at us all the time in like from every direction, you know, in our country, like women are not paid equally as men, even if they're doing the same job just as well. These are just all the, um, you know, all the different ways we're absorbing this, you know, there's no way to receive that except to understand that somehow we aren't being valued as highly as boys and men in our culture, in our society, in our country. There's no other way to interpret that. And I want to talk about some of these other ways that we are you know, absorbing these messages, not just from things like watching the Olympics and having someone allowed to participate who really, I think by anyone's standards, should not have been allowed, should have been disqualified because of his own actions. Why a judge during sentencing is talking about his broken, you know, shattered Olympic dreams really? What about this 12-year-old? Why are we talking about, why do you think this person has a promising future when he just behaved in the most reprehensible way? Why are we talking about that? Why is that factored in? That's, how about her? Like, let's factor her in here and maybe, you know, give her some indication that what happened to her matters and means something. Um, and this is a, a constant thing. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up in New York City, and I remember very well Jennifer Levin in Central Park and Robert Chambers. And that, that guy's face was plastered everywhere. It, she was a little bit older than I was. So I, but I, I went, I was in that same Upper East Side. I went to a private school on the Upper East Side. And, you know, those, I knew the bars that they, the place they went the night that this happened, Dorian's like, we, we all knew these places. And she ended up in Central Park. And her character was completely attacked. That is what we, as girls at the time, that's what we saw happening. Here is this girl who ended up, she had a crush on this guy, and she ended up in the park, and she lost her life. And then they attacked her. And it's the same messaging I've been hearing my entire life. What was she wearing? How much had she had to drink? You know, those are always the questions, and it doesn't change. And so it occurred to me as I was reading up about this Stephen Vandeveld situation that I heard that same messaging during the Robert Chambers <laughs> trial for the murder of Jennifer Levin, and I heard it, I've heard it my entire life. All girls and women have heard it. When any woman comes forward, because she's been assaulted, that's what she's setting herself up for, is scrutiny about what she happened to be wearing that night and what her sexual history is and how much she had to drink. It's like that she was asking for it culture. And that is a, I don't even know how to describe how devastating that is and enraging that is as a girl or a woman growing up in this society. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experiences, too, because I am not speaking from the outside of this experience. I'm speaking from the inside of it. But I'm going to get there in a minute. You know, Chanel Miller is another person. You know, I don't, some of you may be familiar with her case. She wrote a beautiful memoir that I linked in the essay. And that Brock Turner... You know, attacked her, assaulted her while she was unconscious. And the judge talked about his promising future when he was sentenced. And it is very often these judges seem to have a soft spot for, you know, white, good-looking male sexual predators and rapists. And they start talking about their promising futures and that's the messaging that we're hearing, you know, and it is, all of this stuff got me thinking, and there's, there's more. I, I, I ended up watching this show on Hulu called Betrayal, 
a father secret, which I probably shouldn't have watched because I'm already enraged. Um, but you know, the short version of that, and you can certainly go find it yourself or read about it, it's based on a podcast, is this woman with two small children met a man. She got married. She had a son and a daughter from her first marriage, which had ended. And this new guy seemed wonderful. He was great to the kids, you know, just very involved in their lives. They started calling him dad because their own dad was sort of like not in the picture consistently. And he coached, I don't remember, softball or soccer. I don't care enough to go back and check because he is just an awful human being. Um, And essentially what happened, eventually they had their own child together, a daughter. And one day she found a secret file. The wife found a secret file on her husband's computer that was full of what they are calling um, child sexual abuse images. That's the term that they were using. And hundreds of photographs and videos of young children. And a hundred of those were videos he had taken secretly of his own stepdaughter, which is someone he had known since she was like four or five. Someone, again, who called him dad. So, you know, the wife goes to the police, as you would, and abridged version of the story you know the guy gets arrested um he is sentenced to 329 days in the salt lake county jail and two years of supervised probation um he's not he's not allowed access to the internet his iphone is taken away he's got to go through like some kind of cognitive behavioral you know, rehabilitation therapy um, and a mental health evaluation. Well, he ends up serving 10 months, gets out on good behavior, and is acting like this is a regular situation, going after half the assets, trying to get the, I mean, and living in the same town with his estranged wife, his two stepkids who do not speak to him anymore, and the biological daughter who has supervised visits with him, which apparently the state of Utah is going to shift into unsupervised visits because of their reunification laws. So here's a woman knowing this man that I had a child with is unsafe and there is nothing in, in the law and the legal system that I can use to protect my child. Her 10 year old goes to her and says, is the outfit I'm wearing okay? for me to go wear around dad. This is not normal. And there is no way for any of us as girls and women growing up in this culture not to be absorbing the message. The message is men can do whatever they want and they're not gonna pay very much because you don't matter as much. Their futures, their promising futures are more important or their predatory behavior or their violent behavior is going to be excused for the most part. And there's nothing anyone can do. I, I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to say about the wife in that situation and how she is getting, because I, I don't know what I would do having a 10 year old that I couldn't protect that way. I don't, I would be out of my mind. I'm out of my mind, it's not even my child. You know, this is how wrong this is. Um, it all got me thinking about this experience. I'm not going to talk about my own experience too much. I've, I'm writing about it in my memoir and that seems to be where I'm the most comfortable really talking about it. But when I was 16, um, I, I ended up, I had had, um, yeah, I really don't want to go into the details, but I will tell you that basically, I thought I was with a trusted person and I went out drinking with this person, underage drinking at 16, and I was trying to keep up with him. He's a 24-year-old man. And um, I thought he was cute. I thought he was smart. I thought he was funny. I just wanted to play grown up for the night. That's really what I had not ever been with anyone. I, you know, I, I was a kid. I didn't, 
and I was kind of innocent too as a 16 year old even though I grew up in New York City in this regard I was kind of innocent and so I really thought I could just sort of like flirt and have fun and try to keep up with him and drink and then go home at the end of the night and that's not what happened you know and it was um devastating and confusing and painful and I blamed myself for a very long time because I thought you know well of course that's what he thought was going to happen I went out drinking with him I was flirting with him I thought he was cute you know when he said he just wanted to stop by and pick something up I believed him I really thought that's that's what was going to happen and so when he expected more I felt like I had led him on and it was my fault and I apologized and was crying and you know yeah it's just it it did not go the way that it should have and it took me years to understand a 24 year old man takes a 16 year old home in that situation especially when she's crying and like making it clear that she got in over her head and she saw you take her home that is what a good man does. But for years and years, I twisted myself thinking like, I, I, I brought that on myself. And that is because of the messaging. You know, it was awful. It was, it messed me up for a long time. Thankfully, I got counseling and help and there are good people and I linked to um, organizations that are, you know, they have 24-7 phone service if you need and trained people who can speak to you if you need that kind of help but I'm okay now you know I'm a 53 year old woman I've had a lot of time to process and to you know heal and to really integrate that whole experience but that was just one of you know multiple times that I had things and I wrote about it the week prior you know man grabbing me in the stairwell men exposing themselves all the time this is not unusual one in four women have been overpowered like that when they didn't want they, they said no <laughs> you know so it's not it is it is not an uncommon experience and two out of three rapes do not get reported you know I didn't report mine because I felt like I had it was it was my fault at least partly I blamed myself you know and it does a number on you it really does and then if you have people in your life who don't you know can't show up for you for whatever reason um, you know my best friend at the time when I finally told her what had happened she said you flirt too much she was angry with me you know for other reasons but it was just the absolute worst thing I could hear and you know, we ended up not being friends for very much long after that um very much time after that and and you know um the rest of it is stuff that I'll just that I'm saving for the for the memoir that it's just easier for me to write about but it was a huge betrayal on multiple levels because when people don't show up for you or they don't believe you it is a second assault right it's an assault on your feeling of being a worthwhile person with feelings that matter you know it's it is so painful and so it all got me thinking about this awful human being um Andrew Lester who some of you may know the name you may not you probably if I start talking about will remember some pieces of the story but in um 2003 he was on trial he was a one of the heirs to the max factor fortune and he was his net worth was 30 million dollars um he lived in ventura county sprawling mansion on the beach guy never worked a day in his life he surfed all day and he went to this nightclub near his home that was also near ucsb a lot of ucsb students went there and he would slip ghb to women that he met at the nightclub, bring them back to his home, wait until they passed out, and then film himself raping them. And he did this to dozens of women before somebody stepped up. And one of the first people to go to the police and talk about what had happened was a 17-year-old. Now, I could start crying right now. You know, she went to the police and she explained what had happened. 
and they were able to find two other women who were willing to come forward. One of them <laughs> didn't even know what it, she'd had a relationship with him and didn't know what had happened the first night they met until years later when this case happened and the police showed her a videotape of her passed out. And she remembered waking up in the morning and being fully dressed and him saying she had passed out and nothing had happened. And she ended up dating him and you know, they had this brief relationship that ended. She didn't know for years, till years later, that this had happened, you know. So it was her, it was another woman that was a more recent victim. Um, and so he goes to trial. He's accused. He goes to trial. The police found dozens of videos. They didn't, they weren't even able to identify all the women. Some of them, many of them, were barely breathing because he had slipped them so much GHB, which is the date rape drug, they were almost, you know, they're just completely unconscious. And this is just, you know, this person is a, a sociopath at best. And so they go to trial, um, and basically they're going to break for the holidays, because it's like December, and the judge decides to send him home with an ankle monitor and a million dollars bail. And the prosecu prosecutorial team was very worried and said, please don't, he's a flight risk. Like, please don't do that. Um, and, and the judge would not hear of it. Sends him home, he disappears over the holidays. So you might or may not, you know, maybe remember this, maybe you don't, but I do. I, I was you know, trying to, I was very aware of the case because it was everywhere. His face was all over the place. The fact that he's like an heir to, you know, this fortune. He's a good looking guy. And his story was these women came back with me willingly to make porn films. That is, that was what he was saying. And I mean, there was so much evidence <laughs> to the contrary, um, and clear filmed evidence to the contrary. And, you know, one of the, one of the victims that he, that he brought back with him or the survivors is how I prefer to, to say it was with a friend, a guy friend who, you know, went, went back there with her to the house and was very much, this was not, <laughs> anything to do with making a film that is not what happened um so whatever there was it was beyond anyone's reasonable doubt what had happened there was no confusion this man was an absolute terror and a threat to all girls and women the end so there's a trial he goes home he disappears and so there's this worldwide manhunt you know, trying to, to find him. And in January, um, the, the case resumed without him in absentia is what it is. He's not there. He's absent and he is proven guilty, uh, and sentenced to 124 years. And then this manhunt begins and months went by. Like I was just, you know, able to stay under the radar so it was a um a case that just continued to kind of garner attention and was in the media and I go back to New York it's June still not found so the guy's been on the run for like six months and I'm out to dinner um at a big table full of people friends family and I start to hear um, snippets of conversation kind of, you know, floating down from the end of the table. My mom was there. Um, my mom would like, if I, if I was, she knew, you know, she liked to go out. And so sometimes if it was going to be like, I was going out with a bunch of friends, she would invite her for, you know, like we'd, there'd be a combined dinner, especially if I was just coming back for, you know, four or five days, which is usually how I did it when I first moved to Los Angeles so I'm at this table and she's kind of like at the other end with her friends and I'm with a bunch of you know my friends and I'm I'm, I'm hearing snippets of conversation and this man who's a you know friend um, of the family 
I realize that he, they're talking about the case and he is saying he doesn't believe these women. You know, this is a good looking guy with millions of dollars, with this sprawling mansion on the beach, heir to the max factor fortune. He doesn't need to be drugging and raping women. He can have anyone he wants. Clearly, these women came back of their own will. You know, maybe they'd had a little too much to drink or whatever, but they wake up in the morning and they see this gorgeous place and they figure out who he is and they decide they're going to make these accusations so they can get, well, I am sitting there and, you know, this is, I mean, 15 years after what had happened with me. And... I will share with you that when I finally told my mom, she didn't, she didn't believe me or she didn't want to believe me. Um, I think maybe it was like too painful for her to accept like, you know, something like this had happened. She also trusted this guy. So, um, so she didn't believe me at the time. And, um, and that was a really incredibly damaging moment in our relationship obviously as it would be you know 16 I was not okay it was months later I was I was unable to ride a public bus or you know a subway I was walking miles everywhere because I couldn't I couldn't stand to be that close to strangers I couldn't sleep I couldn't eat like I was not doing well and I finally told her, and it's, you know, again, a longer story, but um, she was unable to, she was unable to, to be there for me and to help me. And it was a second really painful, awful betrayal, you know, it just was. And it was really, um, it was a, it was a serious moment in our relationship where I just thought like this is not I don't know I don't know how we're going to recover from this this is going to be really tough um and a lot of rage came up for me too about all the drinking and just all of it I felt so deeply let down and so deeply betrayed and so now we're at this table and this guy is saying these things and I am listening like in that way that you do when you're maybe in a group, but you're hearing something, and so your brain is totally focused on that. You know, you've, you're not, you're no longer engaged with anything, just your ears are completely, you know, perked to this one thing. And I was waiting for her to say something, you know, to say anything, to say, oh, come on now, this is, don't be ridiculous. Like, there is video footage, are you kidding me, of dozens of women. There's video footage. There's no doubt about whether he did it or not. These are not women that, like, willingly went into, that is not what happened. I'm waiting for her, and she isn't saying anything, and no one is saying anything. No one is saying anything. And my heart is, like, pounding, pounding in my chest. My hands are shaking. I'm, like, having a hard time breathing. And I realize now I was having, like, PTSD kind of symptoms going on there, you know. And I suddenly, it was like everyone was frozen and staring at me. And I realized I had said all that out loud. I was yelling at this man. I had, I had completely almost had, like, an out-of-body experience where I, I said to him, you know, are you kidding me right now? Like, are you serious? Like, I, there's, there's video, you know, there's video. Are you, how can you be saying these things? Like, what do you need in order to believe women? It's hard enough to come forward. You know, what can you be, what can you be thinking right now that you're saying those things? And I was not raised to express anger, to talk back. You know, I, my mother was very big on, I mean, how things looked, appearances is really important to her. Certainly I was never to talk back or to be disrespectful to, you know, my parents' friends. I wasn't even really, there was no space for my anger anywhere in the house. If I ever expressed anger toward my mother, that was shut down. Um, you know, that was anger, rage, 
even sadness, if it was like showing too much, that was not acceptable. You go do that in your room. You know, if you're going to be in a shared space, you're going to be polite, respectful. You can be happy. Um, you can be funny if I'm in the right mood. You can be entertaining. You can be kind and caring, um, helpful. But anger, absolutely not. And sadness, probably not. Because, like, I'm going to have to stop what I'm doing. And, and, and you know, I don't want to feel uncomfortable. So you need to just push that stuff down or handle it by yourself. So I suddenly realized, like, I, ha I have had an outburst. <laughs> you know, I have said all these things. And it's, I mean, it's frozen. Like, people are sort of like forks in the air staring. And I am aware that I, I'm just like tears are, you know, and I'm shaking and I'm having this heart pounding. And I look at my mother and she looked devastated she wasn't angry with me she looked you know stricken horrified and I just jumped up knocked my chair over and ran out of this restaurant I didn't write about this um in the essay but because I didn't want to get too much into my relationship with my mother it wasn't really what the essay was about but she followed me and told me she did believe me and she was sorry and you know she we had a good moment that was meaningful to me like it, it meant a lot to me that she finally said that all those years later I mean obviously you know I really needed to hear it when I was 16 and having so much difficulty processing what had happened and feeling shame and feeling confusion and feeling fear and feeling you know but it certainly was better to hear that from her at some point than never to hear it at all. And um, so that is kind of what I, you know, wanted to, it's very hard to talk about this stuff because first of all, it's painful to, it's not comfortable for me. I don't enjoy talking about this. I'm not beyond sharing it with you. That's, that's like as far as I, you know, and writing about it, like I'm not, it is a lifetime ago. And um, I am, you know, I am okay, as far as like my own personal life and healing. But what happens for me is when there are cases in the news, or I hear judges talking about some guy's promising future, or I hear someone at a table questioning whether some woman is lying when clearly she isn't it is that is when the rage comes up because that is unacceptable you know and that's part of I wanted to dig into this idea that sometimes rage and healing go hand in hand that sometimes in order to heal, you really have to let yourself feel the rage. And I think for so many girls and women in our culture and our society, we are taught to push that stuff down. You know, if you are angry as a girl or a woman in this culture, it's, you know what names we get called. You know, if you are ambitious, if you are unwilling to you know toe the line if you are different in any way you're gonna you're gonna get attacked your character is going to be attacked your morals are going to be attacked your worth as a human being is going to be attacked and it is one of the reasons that when I see an entire political party um, putting girls and women in so many states in danger, it is enraging. It is re-traumatizing. Um, it is unacceptable. And it isn't about abortion. <laughs> it isn't just about abortion. You know, I don't know if anyone can possibly be missing that very important fact. But 
my rage, my outrage, my, you know, is not just about reproductive rights and, and bodily autonomy. It's about the fact that when Roe was overturned and the former guy, you know, intentionally appointed ultra conservative Supreme Court justices who have very, very conservative views about this. Okay, most of the country, 63%, I think, wanted Roe. Roe v. Wade was the law of the land, and nobody wanted it overturned. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. The majority of people, it's, I'm pretty sure, 63% of people did not want it overturned. Um, and when that happened, and it was now, it has been up to the states to decide what laws they want to pass, 21 of them have passed abortion bans to some degree or another, and some of them are incredibly restrictive and do not have exceptions for rape or incest. Some of them are, if you get pregnant, the only way that you might be able to not carry this baby to term is if you might die. And even then, your life really needs to be in jeopardy. So we have that going on, and then we have states that say, okay, um, you know, we're, this, we're we're anti-abortion, except we'll make, we will make exceptions for rape or incest. <laughs> then you have to prove it. Then you have 45 days to report a rape. And your doctor needs to question you and maybe see your police report. You might, there may be states where you're allowed to just tell your family physician, but many of them are going to require that you go to the police within 45 days. Can I tell you the state of mind you're in 45 days after something like that happens? It's, it isn't, it isn't pretty. You've just been violated and your entire, you know, inner life is in turmoil and going and talking to, going to a a police station and telling strangers that is like the last thing you want to do especially when you know what's going to happen to you because you've seen it a million times what was she wearing how much had she had to drink you know it's like that is why two out of three rapes don't get reported so these exceptions are you know this is no this is this is not some great help to women in this situation. And you may think to yourself, hey, it, you know, I'm not okay with it under any circumstances. That's another conversation. I, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I am not, that is not my view. That is not my view, um, clearly. But my problem right now is that there are girls and women in all these states whose well-being is now in jeopardy and lawmakers are deciding about their quote-unquote promising futures and what they're worth. And those lawmakers in the states with the restrictive, the most restrictive bans, they're white men, <laughs> most of them, and they are making decisions and they're always, they're always the states with like no exceptions and you know, an incredibly uh, low age of consent. I mean, it's wild, you know, and that is where I am beside myself with fury. It's like the same kind of men who would do something, who would take something <laughs> that doesn't, that isn't willingly given are the same men that want to restrict your rights and tell you what you can or can't do with your body. Or tell a woman like Kate Cox, who had a pregnancy that was not viable. There was no, the baby was not viable, and she wanted more children. She goes to the hospital, and they will not treat her because her life is not at risk enough. The doctors are afraid if they give her the DNC that she needs to save her own fertility and her life, 
they might lose their medical license. So this is my problem. It's the women and girls who are being sent to parking lots when they go to the hospital because they're bleeding out. And any man or boy that goes to the ER bleeding out is going to be instantly taken and treated and their life, you know, saved. It's not the same for girls and women. And, and then you're talking about we don't even care if this situation that you're in is because some man assaulted you. Too bad. <laughs> it's like that is not, I mean, anyone, really anyone should be able to look at that and understand it's not okay, you know. And I think part of the reason um, that we're in this situation that we're in is because everyone swims in these waters. Everyone swims in these waters, and they're, it's a constant, the messaging is constant that, you know, men and boys are valued more than girls and women. And now you have a political party that is talking about um, a woman is not as valuable if she doesn't have children. She doesn't have a physical stake in the future of the country if she doesn't have children. I actually found myself on a, a wild and unbelievable thread of this woman today. Um, very conservative woman who was absolutely saying, yes, I am morally superior because I have children and you don't, to another woman. Yes, I have the moral high ground. Yes, I care about things more deeply than you do because I have children and you don't. Like she was just fully defending that. And I was amazed. Like, wow. You know, just just blatant misogyny. It's what it is. And there are a lot of women who have been swimming in these same waters and have been growing up in the same culture and sometimes conservative cultures. You know, this woman was also like, yes, I am the wife of a, you know, I'm conservative and I'm a trophy wife and my husband worked hard for me. I mean, I was just floored, you know, that somebody would be so, so sort of uh, proudly misogynistic. And, you know, the level that you have to be immersed in this messaging to get to that place is where we are. Um, you know, watching the Olympics and seeing someone competing who raped a 12-year-old 10 years. Like, why is that okay? Or listening to, you know, judges passing down sentences, worrying about this guy's athletic career. Or he comes from a good family. This was his first offense. Let me tell you something, Okay. If your kid assaults a girl or a woman, he doesn't have a promising future. Something's gone very, very, very wrong. I say that as someone who has a son and a daughter. That is, you know, that's not where you are anymore. Like, it's already, it's already way past the point that, like, somebody needed to step in and get this kid help. He's probably, like, hurting animals first. You know, this is not, this is not it. And so part of what I was um, writing about is how emotional I got the other night listening to Kamala Harris and Tim Walls in, um, in Pennsylvania. And that's Walls with no T, by the way. <laughs> um, openly talking about this. You know, openly just speaking out about reproductive rights, bodily autonomy, women's rights. It is really just treating women with the same level of respect and consideration as we treat men. It's not, you know, that's what we're talking about. And trusting women the same way that we trust men to make decisions about their own bodies and boys and girls, like, you know, trusting. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a, a bunch of people who are, there is so much repression and fear. Um, you know, they're worried about, I mean, just, just wild, wild stuff here. You know, um, let me try to help a little bit because in order to change this, it's so pervasive, it's so systemic, 
it's not like there's one thing that we're going to do that's going to turn things around and make it an equitable society and culture for girls and women overnight. That's not going to happen. But some of the things we can do, um, certainly, first of all, calling it out, talking about it openly, you know, talking about what it feels like when men do things all over the place. And if you're, if you think this is just me talking about this stuff, please go look at the essay I wrote last week and the week before, you know, um, last week's was smile. And there are so many comments from so many women who are like, yes, me too. (laughs) Yes, I was grabbed. Yes, men have pushed themselves up against me on the subway, on the buses, like, Every, it's, it's not a few. It is most women that you know, if you ask them, have had some kind of violation, some kind of violence, you know, whether it was having someone expose themselves or come at them or worse. So it's, it's most of us. And because because we are taught when we do speak up that like nothing much happens there is this message of like you are somehow complicit or this is somehow your fault um and i mean this in all the ways even when you walk by a construction site and men yell lewd things and no one around you says anything you're getting a message as a teenage kid, you know, you're getting a message that somehow this is like tolerated and it doesn't matter if you're embarrassed. Like it's somehow your fault because you have breasts and you walked by a construction site um, or you crossed the street and somebody cat called you and you're trained to receive these things as compliments. Someone tells you, hey, baby, you're beautiful. You're supposed to smile and say thank you why you know why some dude on the street is talking to me like I'm an object and I'm supposed to receive that as a compliment I don't want to hear that I didn't ask for that I'm not in a conversation with you you know I'm not here for your consumption that isn't why I exist but that's constantly what we're being taught you got to you know look right you have to be thin and pretty and I mean this is what I mean it is pervasive and so we get used to it it's normalized we're like oh okay you know like the male gaze I'm supposed to like want the male gaze so I you know I've got to figure out what what gets me that attention because apparently that's how I know whether I have value or not it's based on how I look. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like a constant, it's all the time. You're breathing it in all the time, and there's no way. And, and so are the, by the way, so are the boys and, you know, the men coming out of this. They're also breathing it in. They're also getting these messages that it's, they can take up space. They can be loud. They can run. They can, you know, it's their world, and we're just living in it. And so they man spread and they, you know, you sit down in an airplane and there's a guy just like taking up half your space without even thinking about it because they're growing up in the same, you know, the same environment and they're getting the same messages. So it all needs to change. And one of the things is talking about it openly. And I think that in order to even get yourself to talk about it, because I'll tell you the last few weeks, like not so much this week because the comment section has been so unbelievable that I feel empowered and I feel like, okay, there are a lot of women who want to be having this conversation and want to share their stories and want to say yes, me too. And like, you know, are, are ready to start naming things and calling them out. That made it a lot easier for me to hit publish this week and to do the podcast today. Because I think all of us are realizing like, you know, it's, it's not okay. It's not okay. And it needs to change. Well, how do you change it? First of all, you at least have to talk about it. You have to name it right that Dan Siegel thing you have to name it to tame it he's a child psychologist if you don't know him um but more than that it's like we need to see more women in power everywhere 
in, in our culture, right? Not just like on the political stage, but in our creative lives and our everywhere, you know, because people who have been through this and understand are going to be speaking to it in a different way, which is why I got really emotional when Kamala Harris was talking about reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy and trusting women. I got really emotional because she could say those things with a steady voice and, you know, she's completely fired up and she meant it and she means it. I've heard her talk about this multiple times now. She means it in that way that only a woman who has had to fight twice as hard for space at the table is going to understand. You know, that's just how it is. Like, she can speak to it the way that she can speak to it because she's lived through it. And, I, and as a woman of color in this culture, she's lived through it a lot harder than I have. You know, it is the, the sexism and the racism and the way that she is being attacked is disgusting. It's disgusting. And she's still holding her head up, you know? And you may not love everything, whatever. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to get into that, but I can tell you, this is an, an accomplished, brilliant woman who worked her ass off to get where she is and has a wildly brilliant mind and the ability to withstand a whole bunch of crap. <laughs> There's no other way to end up as vice president, the first female woman of color vice president we've ever had, you know she's she's made of some pretty some pretty amazing stuff so yeah I got really emotional and I do get emotional listening to her openly talk about it I didn't even know how much I needed to hear it and then Tim Walls talking about it same hearing a man stand up for women in this culture we need more of that we need a lot more of that you know if you're wondering as a man listening to this what you can do if you see things happening on the street, say something. You know, my 15-year-old my was harassed on the street a few months ago. My 15-year-old daughter by some man, and I was not there, and she froze. She was scared. You know, it happened on the street. And thankfully, her female guidance counselor from her high school was driving by, saw what was happening, because this man was like right up on my daughter, and, you know, she was pressed up against a street, street light and um, pulled over and said, are you okay? And she said no, and she got in the car. And, you know, when my daughter got home, she told me there were four guys standing there who looked like they just came from the gym, like big, beefy guys who did not do anything. They watched. They saw what was happening. They did not step in. They did not say to this man, get away from her. That's a kid. Get away from her, you know, or, or physically move him away or block him like it was a mom who drove up who just happened to be driving by who saved the day like help <laughs> help you know that would be good it's not we don't need saving we don't need saving okay we're like you know strong capable people but if you see something do something don't stand there and act like it's okay or it's normal or you don't want to get involved. Like, get involved. Um, you know, there's this whole conversation about tampons right now. Are you kidding me? It is great for there to be tampons in public school bathrooms everywhere. What are you worried about? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, let me say some other things here. I want to wrap it up. But, you know, as the mother of a son and a daughter, allow me to tell you, like, my son has known how babies are made. He's 17 years old. He's known for a very long time. The first time he asked me, I told him. I told him in an age-appropriate way, but I told him. And the first time he asked me is when I was pregnant with his sister, you know, and I explained it to him. Again, age-appropriate. <laughs> but as he got older and asked questions, I always answered him in an age-appropriate way. And teaching our sons how, you know, how babies are made and how menstruation works and, you know, what tampons are for and what, like, this is just 
this is what, this is normal. This isn't even like a thing. Yes, they should know. Otherwise, they grow up and they're like the dude when their girlfriend says, hey, can you pick up some tampons at the pharmacy? They're like, ew, please grow up. You would not be standing at the pharmacy if your mom hadn't had a period. <laughs> like, get it together, okay? If you have issues about it, work on it. Like, it, you're way late, but like, work on it. Start today, you know? I mean, I'm not, I don't want to shame anyone. Maybe you grew up, like, that's what you, that's the culture you grew up in. But like, do better now, you know? If you are a grown man or you are a teenager a teenage like you can start to make you know make your own uh form your own thoughts about things and and certainly nothing that has to do with you know uh, reproduction if you if you're gonna if you want to partake on any level like d d you know grow up like grow up and so one of the things if you are a mother and you have um, you know, you have daughters and sons, have these conversations. I mean, my God, like certainly not just, you know, with your, with your daughters about like, obviously I've done that, you know, <laughs> I would breathe fire for my daughter, but, and, and, and have had a, a million conversations with her because I, I want her to be, to feel safe and strong in this world and valued. You know, I want that. And, but also with your sons. I know too many really smart progressive women who shy away from having like the sex talk with their boys. Why? Because you're uncomfortable? Get over it. <laughs> who is going to teach your son better about consent and about women's bodies? If, if your son is straight, he may not be. But if he is, who's going to teach him about that better? You as a woman and his mom or his dad? Who's going to tell him, you know, from a female perspective about consent and about women's bodies and about what women need or like, you know, I mean, these are just, and tampons in the bathroom, I mean, give me a break. What are you worried about? Let people live. Let them live. Can you not understand that the, the biggest problems we have in this world, the whole world, not just this country, are from fear and othering people. Someone loves differently than we do. Someone prays differently than we do. They speak differently. They look differently. And we other them. That is where all the trouble has been for the human race from the beginning of time. You know, can you not fathom that it is a good thing for the next generation of kids to be accepting and to not worry about, you know, who their friends love or how they identify or it's like what are you so worried about what is it that you're so worried about what is the fear do you think if your son walks into the boy's restroom and he sees tampons he's gonna somehow I don't even know what you're worried about like what are you worried about <laughs> I don't I, I really don't understand do you like these old gender norms where men are supposed to be strong and tough and not express their vulnerability and their fear and women are supposed to be polite and kind and nurturing? Isn't it going really well for all of us? No. <laughs> no, it is not. Like, just, you know, live how you want to live. Love how you want to love. Like, pray or don't pray, you know? Like, just live your life. You have one life here. Stop worrying about what other people are doing. It doesn't affect you. Just don't worry. Nothing is going to happen. Your son can walk by tampons at the pharmacy just like he can walk by tampons in the public school bathroom. It's okay. I, I just, everyone, please, like, just try. You know, try to step back and recognize these things that we have been accepting is just the way things are, step back, like pull yourself up out of the water, take a deep breath, you know, come up on land for a minute and ask yourself, like, what, what have I just accepted as, you know, as normal because it's been normalized? And maybe question it, you know, question it. And like, ask yourself, are these beliefs making me a better person, a more loving person, a more peaceful person? 
or am I like filled with rage and hate all the time? Because that's, that's not fun. You know, for me, when I feel outrage, it's always like around these issues where I see people suffering and then I can use that rage. I let myself feel it and then I figure out once I'm not in the like, you know, super ragey feeling, once I've let that move through me, then I can figure out what do I want to do with that energy that that rage just released. That's where the healing happens. What can I do with these feelings of outrage if I'm outraged about something, anything? What is one positive thing I can do? You know, can I, I don't know, can I volunteer? Can I make a donation? Can I make a phone call? Can I send an email? Um, you know, if I have a friend who doesn't want to talk to her son about sex, can I maybe just say to her, like, let's talk. Why are you worried? What, what is uncomfortable for you about that? You know, let's talk about, like, can you do anything? <laughs> you know, like, is there some small thing you can do? Because it all matters, and we kind of need to be doing all of the things. If you work at a company and you are a woman and you aren't being paid what your, you know, your male colleagues are being paid doing the same job, I mean, what would be great is if the men started asking why. That would be terrific. You know, it's like if you have girls and women in your life that you care about, it would be so wonderful for you to step it up and certainly be voting like you feel that way. I mean, what are you prioritizing if you're not prioritizing this? Like, what's, you know, really? Like, are you really okay with... 51% of the population having to fight for just basic, basic rights, you're just going to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm like a straight white man. I'm safe, so I'm just going to kind of like vote for my wallet. <laughs> like, is that really it? Because, I don't know, that, that can't be good for you. That can't be a good way to live. So that's where I'm at. You know, I um, I hope this is helpful. I know it's sometimes really difficult to talk about experiences like that where maybe you've, um, you know, you've been overpowered. Um, it's no, it's no joy to talk about this stuff, but I can tell you that I'm, I'm stronger when I do talk about these things and name them and call them out because I don't, I want a better world for everyone, everyone, you know? Um, yeah, I hope this has been helpful. If you have things that you want to talk about, I think I'm pretty easy to find. The comment section under these essays lately has been pure gold. I mean, there are like, major conversations happening there that if you could use like some inspiration or some comfort or some you know just community you really might find it there I have been blown away um, and, and incredibly grateful for people who are being brave and just like talking about their own experiences and growing up this way it's a lot you know it's it's there's a lot of there is a lot of heartache there for a lot of us and it is better to talk about it and name it. You know, not not before you're ready. If you aren't ready, definitely I'm not encouraging anyone to, like, make themselves share anything that they don't feel ready to share. I did, as I said, I did link resources. If you're someone who is, um, you know, if you are, like, struggling sometimes with healing, like, you're, you're good most of the time, but then something triggers it. Or, you know, like, just to be kind to yourself. And it is triggering to be in an environment where... There are people saying like awful, awful things and questioning your worth as a as a person based on whether you have children or you don't. Like it's it's pain, you know, it's painful. It hurts. And so to acknowledge that and recognize that and take care of yourself um, and to reach out if you need help. All right. I'll uh, I'm sending you lots of love till till next time. Take care out there.